Hi, this is Conrad Zimmerman of Fish Shark Marketing, reminding you that this show exists because people like you support it. Go check out patreon.com slash fish shark or click the big Patreon button at fishshark.com for more details on how you can help become part of the problem. And thanks for listening. Well, I think, as far as tests of loyalty go, and you can't be too careful these days with corporate espionage, I think it was a fair enough test. I think it was a, an, an error on the end user. Because I managed to complete the objective. I managed to do what the senior partners told me to do, because I'm a very loyal and good employee. No, oh, no, I, I, I don't disagree that the idea was really sound. Like it was a really smart idea, but I kind of feel like maybe the execution of it might have been handled a little better. Because I am all about getting employees on a system that ensures that they are dedicated and uh, and and motivated to 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 do their jobs. Well, that's exactly what the whole system was set up to do. As a marketer, you're supposed to hustle. And it's very motivating. I, I, I understand that. I mean, it, the, the sense of urgency in that email is very strong. It's a strong order. As any advertisement should be. Right. Marketing has a strong message. It, it lets the consumer know that they have to act now. That's what that was about. That was about sending an email and getting it to spread virally through the web by getting people to send it to more people and then getting those people to send it to even more people, thus spreading the advertisement that the senior partners wanted to spread. And, and, and it worked, right? And that email's going everywhere now. And I mean, it's, it's probably one of our most effective campaigns. Oh, for sure. I mean, I forwarded it to more than the 10 that I had to. Just to just to show how extra dedicated I am, I did a whole 20. I was sending it to people I don't even know. I was thinking about doing that, but I, I, I didn't. I was, you know, I was busy, and I, I, I usually like to go above and beyond, but this time I just sort of, I did my 10. You know, I sent it, I forwarded it on to my 10 peeps, and I left it at that. And I'm really glad I did, if I'm being totally honest with you, because... About an hour and a half later, someone that I know connected to someone that I sent the email to sent me the email again. Now that's interesting. Already the word circling back round. Right, but this does represent a bit of a problem because I successfully got, you know, my 10 out and I only did the 10. And so I'm fine because I could just send out to another 10. Yeah. But, but what starts happening once, you know, we've reached peak email? Once it can be forwarded no more. Right, because I, I would feel like at that point, we're in a position where the consequences of failing to forward the email on would come into play in, in like a really big way. Well, yeah, the senior partners would be annoyed that people didn't do what they were told. And, and that's, that's very, very bad. We all know that's bad. Nobody likes it when the senior partners get annoyed by something. They tend to get shooty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very shooty bang bang with the guns uh, and the real bullets. And far be it for me to question the motives and capabilities of the senior partners, along may they reign. But I, I don't know if the end game was really thought fully out. Is it, is it a problem with the way the email was written? Maybe it is a problem with how it's written. Everybody in the office went and did their due diligence, did their job. Everybody here that got the email sent it out. And everybody here got the email because one of the first things most people did was send it to other people in the office. And that's just standard. Well, yeah, obviously. If market first to the marketers. The building is covered. You know, every division of Fish Shark has gotten the email by this point. And, and I, I would assume dutifully sent it on because they, you know, understand the risks. Spreading it like wildfire, getting that promotion out there. But I'm a, I'm a little concerned about the response from people out there. I think I think people are ignoring it. What? Yeah, I, I think they're just 
not sending it on. How could they not take Fish Junk Marketing up on this great, great limited time offer? You know, if I'm, I'm totally honest, that's that might be part of the issue. Just just calling it a, a great, great offer. Really? You, you don't think that an email titled great, great offer in all caps, followed by many exclamation marks and emoticons was a good idea? You, you think that was not a good idea? It doesn't really convey exactly what it is that people are are interested in getting. Well, a great offer. I mean, the the moment I got it, I opened it excited to see what the offer was and how great it was. And it was great. Great. Great is relative. Great's a term that can mean wonderful. It's also a a word that can mean um, massive or overwhelming or um, uh, a grave danger to you and your loved ones, right? Right, right. Maybe some people are confusing one for the other, or they don't. Re- it's not really clear to them, but they, I, I get the sense that they're disregarding it on the vague, and that's, a, that's dangerous. You know, because as we all know, if the senior partner sends you an email with instructions, you really, you can't, you can't just blow that off. Well, no, 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 no. They, they, they want to know whose side you're on. You know, if you're not sending the email on, you're not on the side of the senior partners, right? As far as we know. Okay, well, I mean, let's... All right, so let's, let's open up the email. Subject line, great offer inside, great, great offer. Okay. Okay. What was the sender name again? The, the sender's name is Erect. Mm-hmm. And the subject line... Great offer inside, great, great offer. And then all the emojis, yep. emojis and pizza, very exciting, very colorful. Uh, I open direct email straight away. Inside the email, the body of the email says, forward this email on to 10 people within seven days or you will die. Okay, which I did. And 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 why are people not, like like, again, that's a great, great offer. Why are people not forwarding that on like they've been told they that how are they not getting this here's the weird thing right that i i, I kind of noticed about that because i mean it, it's it's very straightforward it's very explicit it's very clear right the it's all laid out i don't understand how people are, are confused about the the necessity of doing this you know and the value but i get the sense because i'm looking through my email now and and I, i'm i'm actually starting to see I got a lot of emails with kind of good offer here or, or unlimited possibilities uh, is, is one subject line. And, and, and inside things that, you know, just forward this on to 10 people to have great luck in your life. And so, oh, so you think people are thinking it's it's one of those. It's not it's not a fish chuck promotion. It's it's just some sort of marketing spam. Not marketing spam, but one of those, you know, fun things that, that, that friends do, you know, where they, they email on. And, and, and there's a lot of people that really hate these things. You know, they, they just see them and they're like, oh, fuck that. Right, right. But, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the concept of spam email. I never really read it myself. It just goes in a folder and I leave it there. But first of all, anything from the senior partners, especially erect, will go straight to my inbox. Naturally. I mean, that's the first thing I do. The senior partners take priority. Yeah, and second of all, it's not spam. Why would you disregard the words of fish junk marketing? Mind-boggling to me, everybody should know that, that failing to heed the words of fish shark marketing comes with a consequence. In, in, in this case, uh, a vague threat of death. They do realize, like, outside of this building, that when the senior partner sends an email telling you you'll die in seven days if you don't do something, you will die, right? Uh-oh. Yeah, that's that's the curse of the chain email. If you don't send the email on and keep the chain going, you'll die. That's the point of it. Right, yeah, that's... Well, I mean, I, t- I took them at their word. I always take them at their word. They did this last year as an internal exercise. And when Terry didn't do it, the senior partners came down and they beat him with billy clubs. That's what happens if you don't send the email within seven days. The senior partners will come to your house and beat you to death with billy clubs. 
We've been here before. Yeah, has nobody learned this lesson? I sent that to my mum. Did she send it on? I don't care. I'm just using it as an example. Well, after what happened to Terry, I could, t- I could totally see you, you sending that email on to your mother just, you know, to see what happens. Yeah, on the odd chance, because she, she, she's the sort of person who just doesn't do what she's told in general, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, uh, she's disobedient. I could see why you would, you would want to send that on, having the theory confirmed. But I'm a little worried, then, if, if it, you know, on this larger scale public test, if, if we made, made a mistake in, in, in not making it clear to people the, the severity of this statement. If that got forwarded as as much as we think it did, I mean, that's at least half the city. Oh, at least. You're right. The consequences could be massive. Well, and then you think about all of the people who did send it on. Yeah. Just expanding the pool. Just widening the net, the drag net. Okay, okay. We're going to have to work round the clock on this. Emergency stations. The first thing I'm going to do is... Order a whole new round of billy clubs because the senior partners are going to go through so many. We've got to get on this quick. We've got to keep these guys happy. Oh, we're going to have to, like, arrange a lot of Lincoln Town cars to get around this city. Like, this has now turned into, like, a like a quarterly project. This is going to take us most of the year. Doris, deploy the dragnet! Names and faces! So I just received the full series outline for the big Friends spin-off revival extravaganza that I think is going to take this summer's TV viewing season by fucking storm. So th- this was uh, this is the vehicle that just focuses on the one most popular friend. Then yes, yes, the uh, the, the the one member of the Frenziverse that I think we've all wanted to see continue. There are many questions about this character. Who is he? What is he? How is he? How is he doing? Is he still in New York? Does he still hang around at Central Park? Does he still have the hots for Rachel? I'm talking about Ross Geller. Of course I'm talking about Ross Geller. Well, is there anybody else in Friends worth thinking about? No. No. And you know how you know that? Because Ross Geller knows that. Ross fucking Geller knows that Ross fucking Geller is Hella. And that is why the show is called Geller So Hella. Oh, it's it's catchy. Right? That's catchy. Because not only does it have Ross Geller's name in it, so you know it's about Ross Geller, it's calling him Hella so that you know he's Hella. Well, and, and why wouldn't he be Hella? Hella Geller, for show. Sure. Faux show. Now, we worked very hard on this show to really isolate what it was about the Ross Gillara character that people really, really like and identify with. And we evolved those traits over time. Because Ross Geller, as the primary protagonist, and nay the hero of the original Friends series, really was shown to win in the end. His... The way he behaved on that show led ultimately to his success. The moral of that show was that act like Ross Geller and you will become a success in business, a success in life, a success in love. So we have, shall we say, heightened those elements to show an older, more experienced Ross Geller who is still 100% lovable and 100% ready to do it. With the ladies. Fair. Oh, so he's single again? Kind of. We decided this time around that Ross Geller would be dating three separate partners. Now, these partners don't know about each other. There is some light comedy, some light farcical elements, as Ross Geller struggles to keep each girl from knowing the other. One of them, yes, is Rachel. No, we couldn't get Jennifer Aniston back. She's too busy with success. But we did get Lisa Kudrow and slap an orange wig on her. So I think we're golden. Good enough. I I certainly wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Yes. So a lot of the story will focus on um, Ross's continued psychological breakdown of Rachel. Uh, Really kind of going to town on annihilating her sense of self-worth. 
As we all know, there was a vanity to the Rachel character in the original Friends series. She was very uh, preoccupied with her looks. Um, It did lead to a successful job in the fashion industry that Ross heroically put a stop to. Uh, You know, she gave up her life in Paris to move in with Ross and continue their life together. They got married. Backstory for the show, three days after the marriage, the marriage got annulled because Ross couldn't really stand her, uh, but they are slowly rekindling their relationship at the start of Gellis O'Hella, and it's there that we really start to see the gaslighting and the uh, the slow erosion of racial self-confidence uh, that I think people are going to tune in to just laugh along with every single week. It sounds like a tremendously funny, rollicking good time. And so this takes place not too long after the original, or, or how much time has passed, do you, would you say? Uh, this is set in the near future of 2021. Oh, okay. So so it's been quite a bit of time. So then that child that uh, Ross and Rachel had together uh, would be a little bit older. That's a, a great age for a, uh, a child actor, someone precocious to, to be in a show like that. That's a great hook for the relationship. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He has a son... With Rachel, uh, it turns out, uh, in I think in the pilot episode, in fact, we, we, we kind of established this instantaneously, that after they split, he quite aggressively, um, viciously went after her for first custody, uh, and then when he realised that would involve a lot of effort and expense, uh, visitation rights. Uh, he doesn't necessarily want to see the child, but it does allow him to have this consistent contact with Rachel that he can um, use to pursue a relationship again. Uh, One that he doesn't particularly want or desire, but one that habitually, almost obsessively, he craves. Uh, So there's this kind of running joke that uh, the child is at Ross's house over the weekend watching television illuminated in the blue glow in a very dark room uh, that instantly cuts to Ross with exciting music getting ready for a date with another woman that he wants to fuck and forget about. That I could hear the laugh track now. It's got a certain je ne sais quoi to it in terms of comedy, doesn't it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's going to be great. Oh, oh yeah. that'll be a really good running goof. I could see some other, you know, potential opportunities to, to re- you know, like, to get both Rachel and the child in a scene together. You know, like, Ross just doesn't show up to pick up the child. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's also got a daughter. That's the other thing that we we need to talk about now. Oh, that's right. So he's dating this other woman. She's 32, and she's who he has his 15-year-old daughter with. And there's this also this this other running joke that sometimes he doesn't show up to see his son because he's too busy hanging out with his daughter, who he likes a lot. Uh, And, you know, every now and then there's this funny joke where Ross accidentally says that he'd uh, love to date his daughter if he wasn't her father. And the laugh track we get on that is just, I mean, I would say it's almost deafening. We've had to tone it down in the audio mix. People really think it's good that Ross wants to date his daughter. That's a little strange, I got to admit. But hey, if it's if it's playing well with the audience, then, you know, we, we're just going to have to keep going on that. Well, it's not that strange when you think about it, because in order to avoid anything, you know, that looks a bit dodgy on camera, the 15 year old daughter is played by Eliza Pushku. Oh, so lovely and such a talent. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely adorable. Um, we're optioning for the, the mother. Um, sorry, the, the, the character's called Crystal. Uh, we are considering having maybe Margot Robbie play her. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I could see that working. Yeah. 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 If, if we can get her, of course. If we can get her. Yeah. She's busy, but, but I mean, it's... You know, it's a Fred spinoff. I mean, for God's sake, we should be able to get just about anybody we want short of, you know, the original cast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we do have Chandler. Oh, we got him. We got, yeah, we have Chandler Bing, who played the character of Chandler Bing on Friends. Uh, he shows up every now and then. He's sort of an antagonistic character. He He's still on friendly terms with, with Ross, but his catchphrase is, uh, Ross, what the hell are you doing? To which the audience is supposed to boo loudly. Right, right. Because, I mean, the whole point, I guess, you know, while we all knew 
that Ross was the the hero, one could say, of Friends all along. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it was an ensemble cast. There was a lot of attention paid to other characters. A bit too much attention, if if I'm being perfectly honest. I really wanted to know more about about Ross. Right. And you know, so, but this gives us the opportunity to really, you know, focus in and drill down. And and it's it's heartening in a way because you know, you don't really get to think about Ross's journey as much during Friends and and how he he works so hard to to alienate and and really in a lot of ways destroy Rachel's life at every turn hilariously so hilariously right you know the the consequences are amusing. It's out of his own, you know, selfish insecurity and and uh, and need for um, uh, feeling loved. It's it's important, right? It's 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 what life's all about. Uh, but it gets kind of glossed over. Yes. In in friends, and so here now we can really tell the story of a man uh, who you know, does all the right things, works hard. And it pays off. Yes. And yes. that's the most important thing, right? Absolutely. I mean, it from the little things, like looking at her before they go out to dinner and muttering, oh, you're wearing that, huh? Uh, to the bigger things, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like a hilarious episode at the museum, which, and yes, Ross fans, don't worry, uh, he is still working as a paleontologist or rock analyst or whatever the fuck he was. Um, but there is this wonderful scene. It's it's in, I think, episode six of the new season where he traps Rachel in the ribcage of a dinosaur uh, until she says she's in love with him and never stopped loving him. And she's crying and she's saying it in a way that implies uh, she's scared and wants to be released and doesn't mean what she's saying. And Ross is smiling and crying and erect and I'm watching it and I'm erect and I just think it's a it's not just a funny scene but it's a powerful piece of English language TV it's a powerful validation you know that you work hard for something and it pays off yes well let's not forget Ross is a nice guy he is. Oh God, yes. I mean, he's the nicest guy, pretty much ever. That's one of the the thing. The other things about the original Friends show is that it was coming around in this sort of ironic period where all of these characters had these sort of deep character flaws that you know they they would overcome, or you know, and and they might you know change in some way by the end or learn some lesson or adjust their behavior. And and here, Ross never did that. Ross was always true. To Ross, right? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, let's not forget that that Ross was almost entirely flawless during the entire Friends run. Mm -hmm. During a very cynical period of history brought about by Tori Amos, um, the 90s were a period where you couldn't be earnest, where you couldn't be sincere, where indeed a nice guy couldn't get ahead. But here was Ross, who was, let me remind you, so sweet... Just a very nice guy. A very sweet man who was constantly put down and put under. You know, we had to watch the vile Joey score with the ladies, and we cheered along with Ross every time he was able to intellectually dominate him and make him feel small Mm -hmm. and sneer at anybody who didn't have a job as good as him. Which, by the way, we are really amping up in this season. Um, He's not just classist now, he's racist too. Oh, oh, that's fantastic. Just add another, another layer of depth to him, why don't you? Oh, I'm so excited. Now, it's it's so great that we can we're, that we're out of that sort of ironic detachment period of entertainment and we can return to something that's earnest and and simple and straightforward and free of criticism let me just say that for the right now we don't want to be critical of the characters that aren't Ross in this show Okay, Ross can be critical. We can't criticize him or the writing of the show or indeed think about the show. Just watch it, take it at face value, enjoy it, don't think about it, don't come complaining to us. Ross is a billionaire in this show. Really? 
Yeah, he has more money in the world than anyone. And also, he lives on the moon. Sometimes. Just commutes to and from the moon? Yeah, yeah. I, I, the writers just really wanted to show how great he was, so there are some scenes where he's on the moon, and he just looks directly at the camera and says, I can go to the moon and you can't. God, Ross is just the best, isn't he? I love Ross Geller from Friends. I think he is someone any man should aspire to be. Plus, he knows a shitload about rocks. And he has a monkey. So, uh, David Schwimmer's a lock then, right? No. Fist Shark Marketing is Jim Sterling and Conrad Zimmerman. Theme music by Ben Rama. Additional music by Alazar Chan. Our editor is Austin Yorsky. Get more episodes and learn how to support the show at fistshark.com. Follow us on Twitter at fistshark for more of our exploits. Complaints can be forwarded via email to fistsharkmarketing at aol.com. And remember, it's okay to be scared. We'd prefer it that way. Goodbye.